19 years old, you know, you're yeah. young and skinny. Well, you're supposed to look completely <laughs> different than now if you were yeah. 18 or 19. Yeah. But I don't have any to really speak of. Yeah. Okay. So tell me, first of all, where you're from. I'm trying to remember. Are you from Fritz, born and raised? or? No, I'm a... I was born in Pennsylvania. I moved to Carlin, Texas when I was 16 years old with my parents. So, and then I'm, I was there for 25 years and I moved up here in 86 to the Panhandle. Okay, what brought you here from? Well, my brother moved up here. He, he worked for Fish, which was a contractor for Phillips. Mm -hmm. And so I moved up here because I got tired of the traffic in Dallas. And yeah. So we love it up here. You know, we, but that's how I got here. I come up here to visit him and then my parents moved up because I think my parents, it, I don't know if they think I, they got looked after me. You know, my parents, I bought three lots in Rockwall down there by Garland, Dallas. And I put my trailer, 14 by 60, two bedroom trailer on the middle lot. And I come home one day and my mom and dad, well, there's a trailer on my other lot. I didn't know who it was until mom and dad came home. <laughs> so they didn't ask me or nothing, but then I moved up here, then they moved up here. And they just looking after me, you know, cause I was in pretty bad shape when I got hurt, you know, and yeah. laid two years in the hospital and mom and dad was there, you know, so. That's what mom and dads do. Yeah. So how old were you when you joined? I joined when I was 18. Turned 18 in May, joined the army in August. I was in Vietnam January 7th. Of what year? And 67, January okay. 7th. And so then I turned 19 in May and I stepped on a mine on my dad's birthday, September 17th. Wow. So, so tell me, let's start with what, what were you trained to do when you went? Well, I was in the infantry. And the first six months, me and my best friend was tunnel rats. We was infantry, but we were the two that went on the ground looking for the enemy. And I was lucky, never found one. I found a little kid the last day I went in. And I have come out, and our guy had shot the VC coming out. I guess they see me coming or heard me, you know, I flashlight. And there were three different times bodies laying there where our guy shot him coming out. They had a gun, and and you know they're BC if they had a gun. So, but last time I seen that little boy, and boy, my heart started beating because I was on my hands and knees, and I opening over here, and his little kid, about four years old, on an army cut. So I guess his dad just heard me coming, and he left. I don't know why he wouldn't take his kid, but he was lucky that day. No one got shot, so hopefully he'll come back and get his kid because we didn't blow it up. We usually blow the tunnels up, but with a kid in there, I didn't want to do that, so. Right. But then the next day, I become the radio operator for the captain. So first six months as a tunnel rat in the infantry, and Bowman and I, we done point. What do you mean when you do point? Well, when the company goes out, we went first, and... uh and then maybe 500 yards behind us, our company was coming up behind us. And we kind of just look and see if there's anything. And we, people thought we was crazy for one point, but we were safer than them ones back there. Because a sniper will open up on 50 or 100 guys before they would on one or two. And at least that's the way we were. You know, so we never got shot at. But when the whole company gets up there and you got 50 to 100 men, a sniper can open up and hit somebody, you know. So we we thought we were pretty lucky. And we was, you know, we we lucky until I got wounded, you know. But I had three days left when I stepped in that mine. And I'm gonna, but, I'm gonna back you up first because I wanna get to that story. But first, tell me about like, when you first got to Vietnam, I mean, what was, what were your, first days like? What? Well, uh, we was back at battalion for about five or six days. 
they try to teach you not to step on mines, which that's kind of impossible because what they teach is not what it is out in the field. You know, we spotted one mine the day I got hit. And if you, and I've stepped on a bouncing Betty before. If you step on it and don't get off, it can't come up and blow. And we carried a piece of aluminum plate, we'd slide under a foot and put weights on them and then get off and then shoot the weights off and then it'll come up and blow. And we've done that before. Still makes you nervous when you're, you know, standing there. But, yeah. But uh, that happened to me w once before I got wounded. And most of the time, if you're walking, you can spot some mines. But, and like on rice paddies, a lot of VC will put a mine on a rice paddy because they know GIs don't want to walk in that mud, you know. So, and I'm one of them, I, I walk on the rice paddies. But we have had seen civilians step on the mine because they would think we we go on a patrol in the morning or at night, and we usually go the same way. And they they put a mine there, but it happened to be as man and woman as two kids stepped on it hmm. and it blew the kid's foot off. And I don't think it killed anybody. But we put them on our helicopters and flew them to the hospital. Were they, you know, uh, were they friendly? Oh, they friendly. were good people. They were, we call them civilian, yeah. you know, good people. And uh, so anytime one got hurt like that, we would put them in our hospital and fix them, you know, hopefully. But right. it, it, it's sad, you know, you hate to see kids get hurt. Yeah. You know. But, so what were the conditions like? I mean, mud and rice paddies and... Well, rice paddies, I forget when monsoon was, but it rained for like four months straight, every day and night. I mean, you you could never get dry. And, and that's how you really took a bath, because you're always wet, you know. <laughs> but, and then when it wasn't monsoon, they they have rice paddies, but they're always like knee deep in mud, and that's why we walked on the dikes, you know. But hot, always hot. It's we would go. We try to wear a t-shirt because our other shirts are heavier, and our soft hats. You know, we never wore helmets when we were on patrol and. Sometimes it's good if you did, because a friend of mine got hit in the helmet. A sniper opened up, and I thought he was dead. But I was on this side of the pineapple field, and, and you had to climb over the pineapple thing where he was, and we were point. And it just happened to, they seen him, and I went over there and was underneath the water, about way steep, trying to feel his body, you know. And of course, I went back to the company because I couldn't find him. And he was standing behind the lieutenant. He said, if I get shot, you're gonna go, go first, you know? <laughs> so, but he was okay, but he had a big knot on his head, you know? Wow. The bullet, uh, yeah. that? Uh, they talk about a lot about what, what they carried and how heavy. Pardon me? What you carried and how heavy. Did we you carry didn't a carry, lot? All you we didn't? carried is our ammo, you know, your weapon, your ammo. We didn't carry like these guys nowadays overseas. Too dang hot, you know, we'd pass out after you carry a lot of heavy stuff, you know. So, and they'd fly sea rations out and drop them off at us, you know, the helicopters. So, in water, you know, that's all we carried is our weapons and water. And, uh, and if it was a nighttime patrol, we'd carry sea rations, you know, if we are gonna be going a couple of days, but. No, we didn't carry much. It's so hot over there, you'd pass out. I don't know how these guys do it in the desert, but they say the desert gets cold in the daytime. I don't know. Hmm. Uh, I don't know about daytime. I thought it was nighttime. Or, or cold yeah. at night, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, we, we didn't carry a lot of stuff. Start with the day that you went out when when this happened to you. 
I mean, what what kind of a morning was it? What were you called to do? The day All I got right. hit? Mm-hmm. Okay, let me tell you. You know, I, to, I told you, or my story shows, I bought a little cross from a Vietnamese kid about five days after I got there. Mm-hmm. And I wore it all the time. And and I admit, I prayed every day. What was it? I mean, It's you... a little pink cross with a Jesus on it. And I asked the kid, you got a blue one? <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, that's the last one I got. I said, okay. So I wore it under my shirt, you know, with my dog tags. And... But the day I got wounded, and this is... I'm proud I served my country. You know, I'm proud it was in Vietnam. But the day I got wounded, the snipers opened up and shot eight of our guys right between the eyes. The best two snipers we ever seen. So we were on our belly, afraid to stick your head up and get shot. So we, Captain, crawled. And now I, he was gone for about 30 minutes, so I crawled looking for him. And I found him. And, uh, I heard a twig snap or something. It, it was in a wooded area, a lot of brush. And I had took two or three guys with me. But he, they heard that twig snap and they hauled, but I didn't know this until the captain said, what are you doing out here by yourself? And I turned around and they were going. I said, well, I had two or three guys with me. And so we went back to the company and we got 15, about 15 other guys to go with us. And we crawled on our hands and knees like 300 yards to get behind the sniper. And we spotted a mine. And the lieutenant says, I'm not going through no minefield. So the captain said, Gary, he called me Skeeter. We got to go get the snipers because they're killing our guys. I said, well, let's go. So we was running to try to get behind them. And I stepped on the mine and I knew I did. So I dropped my gun, and I don't know I did this, to, and got my cross in my hand before the mine went off. Because see, my hand, 146 stitches right here, cut all my tendons, I can't open my hand. And uh, the, I was laying there, and, and the radio was helping, kind of had sitting up in the position, and I said, Captain, where's my leg? I couldn't see my leg or my arm. And he lifted my shirt up, and he said, don't worry, Skeeter, it just broke. I said, broken hell, where is it? And he pointed it up here, and my foot was up here. It broke my femur in eight places. Half my butt was gone. My medical record said buttocks 50%. So. But I'm lucky God was with me, and I believe that. And He saved, me a, saved my life here in the States, too. I wrecked a motorcycle, and he was with me. I had my cross around my neck. So that's how I got hurt. And then they put me on a helicopter. Well, first the helicopter come out and the snipers opened up on us, so they left. So they had to carry me. They made a litter out of bamboo and two shirts. And my leg went between two shirts, so I thought it fell off. And then when they put me on the litter for the helicopter, I could see my leg, you know. And I got to the hospital and I bet there's 10 people cutting my clothes off. And I just got a brand new uniform, new stripes. But the front looked good, the back's what tore up, you know. And I told her, I said, don't cut that uniform, that's a brand new uniform, you know. Of course, I was in shock. And I was awake till they put me on the x-ray table and it was cold and I just passed out. I was there 36 hours in surgery. And I woke up and the first thing I seen well, the first thing, my bandage fell over my eyes, and I woke up three o'clock in the morning, uh, and I said, oh, shoot, I'm blind. I can't see. But the nurse picked it up, and that, that made me feel better, you know. So, but God was with me, and I know that. How, how were the next days after that? Pardon me? The next days after you woke up, that had to be some grueling, uh, uh, the recovery. Oh, I, I hurt, but you get used to pain. I'd never ask for anything for pain. And the general told my mom and dad when they come to visit me in El Paso, they didn't know how I made it because I wouldn't take anything for pain. I said, well, they cleaned my hip. I had a nurse, two of the prettiest blondes, the twin sisters. One worked in the morning and one worked in the evening. This is El Paso Army Hospital. And they would clean my hip, and that hurt. 
oh, I didn't know you had that many nerves in your butt. You do. Mm -hmm. But they would take that, I guess the force that was cotton, oh, I'd cuss them poor nurses. And they said, Gary, you cuss me all you want, and I'll tell you when I'm through, and you can say I'm sorry one time. Now that's a good woman, a good nurse. And they both said that. But you know, when, they, when you hurt so bad, and then when they quit, it felt so good, I never asked for pain medicine, <laughs> you know. But I wish I had, some. but see, you can even give you morphine. You won't hurt. But if you start cleaning, you're gonna hurt. Just like they didn't give it to you. Morphine only works if they don't go touch you. Mm -hmm. So I'm lucky, you know. And that's why they said I healed so quick. You know, they had to take skin off my belly to put on my head, you know. And like I said, I had in the hospital two years, had to learn to walk again. You think you're gonna stand up? Of course, I lost, I down to like 98 pounds. That's kind of the cast after I got wounded. And uh, you stand up, you know, these bars they give you? You stand up, you think them legs are gonna move? They don't move. I had to pick one up, uh -huh. pick them, this one, you know. So, you know, I went through, I, I've had 20 some operations over the years, you know. And, uh, but God is with me. And I had my foot taken off Oh, about seven, eight years ago. I'm getting old, it could be 10 years ago, but my memory's gone. <laughs> but uh, best thing I ever done, my foot hurt for 36 years. I asked the doctor, I said, Doc, I prayed to God last night, you take my foot off. I'm just tired of hurting. He said, we can do it. And they took it off the next day, I, I, well, no, the same day. When I cu woke up from being underneath the surgery and they, threw that blanket off and it scared my wife. She thought I was gonna really be upset because they took my foot off. Best thing I ever done. It don't hurt no more. You know, now if it hurts, I take it off and throw it on the corner, you know. But that's the best thing I ever done. You know, I hurt for 36 years, but I don't like to take pain pills. I got pain pills at home. Every time they do surgery, they give you a bottle of pills. I've got pain pills, a hundred in a bottle, two bottles from the last time I had surgery. I never use them. Hmm. But if, if I have to have one, I got them, you know. Uh -huh. but. So I can't imagine having, being present enough that when you step on that vine, that you don't pull, pull off. How do you keep that concentration going through there looking for, you know, people well, shooting at you and when I was running through that minefield. See, you don't know if there's one mine or 10. Right. I caught the second one because we spotted the first one, mm -hmm. but I stepped on the second one. But but I couldn't stop. Like I said, the first yeah. one, years ago, yeah. I st stepped on one and just didn't move. Yeah. And it, it's got to come up out of the ground before it pulls the pin right. and blows, you know, so. So, but but then you have to be still enough for somebody to slide that plate underneath you. Oh, it makes you nervous. <laughs> you know, you that's metal plate's not very thick. So if you can get it all the way under your foot and put weight on it, you're pretty lucky you can get off of it. Yeah. You know, because you got enough weight on there, it's not going to come up. You know. Meanwhile, there's all kinds of chaos going on around. Oh, here. I know. Like I said, the sniper when I when I stepped in the mine, I had a yellow smoke on my radio because I'd call in helicopters and I had yellow, red, different color smokes. And that happened to be the yellow one went off. <laughs> so here I am, all yellow smoke all over me. And the sniper was shooting at that smoke. And I could see tracers coming right by my head from the snipers. They couldn't exactly see me because of all smoke. But I told the guys behind me to quit screaming. They got hit with the same mind, but not bad enough to go home like I did, mm -hmm. you know. And I. And you're standing up. Huh? And you're standing up, still waiting. Well, no, the. the, the, the when I stepped on that mine and it got me, oh, yes. okay. I was laying on the ground. Yeah. You know? And then they seen the sniper shooting the tracers, and uh, that make you nervous too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but our medic come up through the minefield and stuck me in the leg, and he said, I told him when he came over there, I was there about six months. I said, you'll never have to work on me. You you know you never think about you getting hit. Yeah. At least I never thought about it. But he, he said, what did you tell me when I first got here? 
you know, he brought it up, you know. So, but I thanked him for giving me a shot, you know. And it takes a while. When I step out of mine, it numbs you. But before that morphine started working, you start feeling that pain, you know. And I want a cigarette, which John Wayne always smoked a cigarette when he got shot, you know. And I smoked a cigarette. That's the worst thing you want to do, smoke. <laughs> You're in shock, and then you smoke a cigarette, and then I wanted some water. And they wouldn't give me no water because you're in shock. So I was smoking that cigarette. And when they got me on the helicopter, he said, you can get all the water you want on the helicopter. He lied, too. And I got on there, and I was smoking that cigarette. And I asked that uh, corpsman, real nice guy. Of course, I didn't get to talk to him much because I took that cigarette and put it out in his hand because he wouldn't give me no dang water. I was thirsty. But... <laughs> I apologize to him. He's, you know, he's doing his job. And of course, when you're in shock, if he'd have said when you're in shock, you're not supposed to have any water. You know, I'd have probably felt a little bit better about not asking for it. Yeah. How did your parents get the news? Pardon me. How did your parents get the news? They got a telegram. I'm not sure if it was the day before I got wounded, because the days were different in Vietnam and here, mm -hmm. or the day after. You know, I, I can't remember, but they got a telegram saying your son is slightly wounded. And they didn't say how bad I was wounded. They didn't want to worry him, you know. And then I called him. I'd been bitten on for about a, four or five days, and then I went to Japan for 45 days. And they let me call him from Japan. And I talked to him and told him I was okay and didn't want to worry him, you know. Did they want to be a, on a plane over to Japan? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, well... I had some more surgery to do in Japan, and then they tried to do therapy on my hand, and which it never did work. All my tendons and leaders were cut, you know, hmm. and uh, because of how you were hit. Yeah, in the okay, arm? Cut, that mine went off and blew this. I could see the whole bone all the way down where hmm. it just cut everything, you know, and so. What did you know about why we were over there before you went, and how did how did your view of the war? stay the same or change while you were there? I hate to say this, I was just a dumb kid. When the news come on, I turned to it, a movie or something. I didn't never heard of Vietnam until I went in the Army. Never looked, at, never watched the news. But you learn quick, you know, I, you have to grow up quick. You know, I, I was over there and my friend Bowman, the only one I got close to, you know, and. Uh, so that's why I was always point or tunnels with him. We s stayed together. So there's a couple of times where we getting shot at and just scared. And once he said, Gary, let's go, we went, you know, he kind of took me out of that scared tactic or something, you know, and I, I just trusted him. He was only like, three or four years older than I was, but he was kind of short hair. You know, I thought he was older than that, you know. And, but he was a good friend. We get together every couple of years and go visit each other and we have a good time. We still do. Yeah. Yeah. Did your opinion of the war change while you were there or did it? I, I, I don't know. I, to me, the people would like to sew there, the civilian people, you know, mm -hmm. the people that live in the village where we was at. There's 19 boys in that village, and after we left, and my friend Bowman went back over and seen Mama's son, there's one boy left, and he was kind of crazy. So the rest of them were all killed by the VC, you know. This, when he returned, it was several years after the war. Yeah, that was several years, you know. I, like Bowman went back after 30 some years. Okay. And he'd give Mama son a house full of groceries and give her a couple hundred dollars, which would last her a year or better. And and she, what did she do for y'all? Well, she used to cook for us until I, we get online and grab ducks. They had flocks, of, I mean hundreds of ducks. And he, she, I would try to grab two, you know. And we'd take them to Mama son and she would, we thought she was cooking them for us. See, that, them people over there, every, any kind of animal, they chop it up little bite-sized pieces so you pick it up and eat it. 
Now they pick it up, dip it in the blood of the animal and eat it. No, I'm not that good. But I found that after two or three months, mama's son was, I went in the kitchen. She was putting our ducks in crates to take to Saigon to sell and feeding us rats. <laughs> and I ate rat for three months. Because you don't know, there's the no refrigeration over there. Like Mexico used to be, their steak don't taste like our steak because they don't have the refrigeration. And that's the way I thought, well, those ducks taste terrible compared <laughs> to what our ducks in the United States, you know. I mean, it was hot food. Yeah. You know, so we liked it. And then but we didn't, we watched her cook our ducks next time we went in there. Yeah. <laughs> But, Make sure you were getting done. She was a nice lady. She was, she was yeah. a good woman. Yeah. Huh. So, uh, what should people now learn about the Vietnam War that we don't know? That's hard for me. I serve my country. I'm proud I went to Vietnam because our country told us to. You know, I'd go anywhere. If I was in the military and our country said, we have to do this. I don't, I don't like people. They spit on us when we come home. Didn't spit on me because I was in the hospital two years. And I won't let no one spit on me now. Uh, you know, I, it's not right. And I hope I'm no one, no cops around, because I carry. You know, I don't, I fought for my country because they asked me to. I volunteered the Army, and I'd do it again. I'm just thinking you're supposed to do what your country asks you to. You know, a lot of people might not think that way, but I do. How do you, how do you get across um what that war was like and what it was about and what the soldiers were doing and all of that to kids. You know, the the ones that maybe aren't learning about Vietnam. Aren't what? That, that maybe aren't learning now about Vietnam. What do they need to know? I don't, I don't understand. I don't know, I don't know how to say it. You know, I've, I'm proud I served my country, mm -hmm. you know, and and I'm sure there's a lot of these people now that's proud they serve their country because they're all volunteers, you know, like I joined. And there was a draft back there when I was, and, but I volunteered, joined the Army, and uh, I quit school to join, went to Vietnam. And then President Bush gave me my high school diploma, and they wanted to join the Army and went to Vietnam, got their high school diploma. Which, that was nice. But I don't know how, I can't put, Vietnam down. I think the people liked us over there. Of course, the VC didn't. And we left. They told us at the time we were winning the war. And we could have won it if our government would stay out of it. You know, our government, we were supposed to have permission to shoot somebody. I mean, if you get shot at, I'm going to shoot back. But the government said, you call us and see if we give you permission to shoot back. That's not right. You know, I don't think they'd do that now. They might, but hmm. we could have won that war if, we, if they'd let us fight it, you know. It's, I just don't understand how our government, our colonel used to say, well, I blew up a, I carried an M79 grenade launcher for a while, and I blew up the house because we were getting sniper fire from it. And, of course, the grenade set the house on fire. And the colonel said, who in the heck did that? And the captain said, we did. The sniper was shooting at us. And he's so far up there, you couldn't even see the helicopter. But he had a scope or something. But we were supposed to ask him to shoot back. Our captain didn't agree with that either, you know. If we're getting shot at, we're going to shoot back, you know. But that's our government for you. I, I'm proud I fought for my government, but they shouldn't tell us how to fight. You know, I, I can say if you're doing something stupid, you know, don't open up on a bunch of kids or women. But 
don't tell us how to fight the war. That's my opinion. You know, I know it's not the government's mm -hmm. opinion, but. Um, as part of this project, we're bringing the, the, the wall that heals, the, the replica of the Vietnam Memorial Wall. Um, have you seen the wall? I've been up there four or five times. I went last year on that flight for veterans they took to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. But see, my brother lives in Baltimore, Maryland. Okay. So I went up there, and this is funny. I asked my nephew, my brother's son, to take me to Washington, D.C. He said, I've never been there. And he's born there. Never been to Washington, D.C. Hmm. So he got a map, and GPS. We, he took us and dropped us off, and then he come back and got us later. You know, my wife and I was up there taking pictures and all kinds of stuff. I took two rolls of film. Not one picture turned out. They were all black, so I don't want bad film, I guess. But yeah, somehow. Uh, what did what'd you think when you saw it the first time? Oh, I cried, you know, because some of my friends were on there, and, you know. It's, and there's a guy up there, usually with a book, to tell you what part of the wall your friend's on. And our lieutenant jumped on a grenade to save us, and it killed him. And he was a black man. Lieutenant Sergeant was his name. And I looked his name up. And we, went, we were invited to... Hampton, Virginia, which is high class up there. And uh, we were invited to go up. His family asked me and Bowman to come up there. He's our lieutenant. They put a, what do you call it, from here to here, a statue. Like a bust or B bust torso or, or whatever you yeah. call it. In an office building with his figure and with a congressional medal of honor around his neck, you know. So his family invited me up there, my friend Bowman. And I passed out two or three hundred of my little crosses, and his grandma loved them, you know. And of course, he's, he had two kids, and uh, but they were like four or five when he died, you know. So they had to grow up without their mom, dad, you know. But uh, I, we had a good time, and our captain was up there, and then Bowman and I, you know. How do you think the wall will help? Uh, kind of teach people. I haven't here. seen the little wall that yeah. you're passing around now, mm -hmm. but I, I was proud. You know, you go up there and it's like down in a gully, but the way the wall is, it's level, but it, it goes like that, you know, mm -hmm. and with all the names on it, and it's beautiful. And you see people putting stuff on, they collect stuff, and I don't know if they put it in a museum or what, but. It, it's beautiful, you know, and, and you got other, all your GIs coming, hugging each other and stuff like that. We get emotional too, you know, and, uh, but I, I can't wait to see this little one. I've heard it come around here, but I, had, I didn't get a chance to go see it. Good. So, so tell me about the crosses. What? Tell me about the crosses you make. Well, I, I've given, I make these little wooden crosses and, uh, I've given 103,000 away since 911. That's when I started making them when the terrorists hit New York and Washington, D.C. And I, I've taken, I don't know, there about 500. A friend of mine took them to Washington, D.C. and passed them out to all the firefighters and the policemen that was up there. And, uh, oh, I, I've sent them all over the, I've sent 300 to Israel of course, they don't go by the cross, they go by the star, but they love my story. All over the world, I've sent my crosses. And Included with your with a, a printed up copy yeah. of your story. Yeah. What's been the reaction to that all over? Oh, I have, like I said, 103,000, and if my story touches one person, it makes me feel good. I've given, I'll tell you a little story. A nine-year-old boy at IHOP in Amarillo, his mom and dad run the place. And I gave him a little cross, and it was like this, or maybe a little bit bigger. And uh, I give his daddy a hundred to auction off, and I give him a dozen big crosses to pass out. And uh, he, I went back. This is one of my big crosses. Oh, wow. And, and uh, 
I went back two weeks later and they said the little boy died and I felt so bad. And uh, this aunt come up and told me that uh, they looked, 10 people looked through, he said, every bedroom in the house or every room in the house looking for that cross because they was wanting to bury him with that because he carried it all the time. And they couldn't find it. And they said the next morning they went to the funeral home and they opened that coffin, that boy had that cross in his hand. Mm. So that's why I gotta make them. Yeah. Yeah. But does it stem back fr from you and that cross? Oh yeah. You know, like I said, you pray a lot when you're at war, you know. And, uh, and, and, and like my card says, it says, you're const it's a constant prayer if you don't have time to pray. You know, it's, and God must have been with me if I had to grab that cross before that mine went off, because just a second, I step on the mine and I get off and I, somehow I drop my weapon and got that cross. You know, it sounds like it'd be impossible to do because you step on that mine and you get off and it's right there. And maybe one or two seconds and it blows up, you know. So that's pretty fast for a little guy, you know. <laughs> Throws but, you in the air and everything. Then. Oh, it threw me up. I was going to push my captain down, but when I pushed him, I came back up. And, and he got me, but I say God's with me. He saved my life. You know, and I don't hurt nothing, not right now. I'm not saying I won't hurt tomorrow, but I'm yeah. lucky, you know. As, like I said, I, I heal quick because I don't take pain medicine. You know, I, I've got bottles at home from the last surgery. They gave me 100 pills in a bottle, and then later on they sent me another 100. I, I, I ain't taking any of the first one, you know. Mm -hmm. and. But I got them just in case I do hurt someday. You know, I, I don't see that I will, but. Well, I'm hoping that you don't. Yeah, and uh, well. I appreciate you sharing your stories. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for your service. Thank you, appreciate it.